How are you guys doing? Last session of the day, I'm going to try to be really, really fast and uh, so we can get done a little early. So I'm super excited today. First of all, I'm Adrian. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, do any of you guys use Django? Just curious. OK, sweet. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a brand new Django feature. Uh, it actually has never been shown to anyone. Uh, so I'm kind of excited, but also kind of nervous that it's going to suck. Uh, anyway, the schedule said that the session is titled something like uh, learning from the ex or lessons learned from adding PJAX to Django. I ended up changing that at the last minute because it hasn't actually happened yet. So there haven't been many lessons learned. Uh, but I actually think this will be a more interesting talk because it's about the process of adding this feature to the framework of Django. And uh, I'm going to talk about this in a way that's not Django specific. So hopefully, if you guys use Rails or whatever else, PHP, uh, COBOL, you know, you can do whatever. Uh, you can uh, apply the learnings to your own environment. So uh, I'm going to start out with a philosophy. Right now, we have uh, a very dumb, basic way of working on the web. So the browser requests a page, goes to the web framework, and the framework spits out an entire HTML page. OK? Dead simple. Uh, and if you, so let's just take Wikipedia, for example. If you go to the Wikipedia web page for a web page, because you're feeling recursive, uh, your browser goes there, you get the page, and then say you're you know, enraptured by some link on that page. You click that link, one of those links, say it's hypertext, and then what happens? The same thing. So your browser has to request that whole page, and you get the entire page back. If you're uh, an optimization nut like myself, you may notice there's uh, quite a bit of redundancy here. Specifically, only part of the page is different. So here's the page I started at. Uh, I click the link to hypertext, and I get this second page. But really, all this uh, navigation stuff is the same. Uh, the stuff at the bottom that you can't see in the screenshot, the stuff at the top of the page, it's all the same. The only thing that's different is the content of the page. So what I really would like to see is on the first request to a site, the framework does the job of getting all of the whole HTML. And then on a subsequent request, if you're coming from the same site, it calculates a diff of what's different about this new page from the old page and only bother giving me the stuff that's different. Does that make sense? So the, the thinking here is, number one, it's, it's a nice optimization sort of uh, philosophically, but from a very practical sense, speed is very important on the web. We all know this. Here's a, uh, our blog post from a couple years ago talking about how uh, all sorts of companies, from big, big ones to medium ones to small ones, have had studies that time and time again show that faster pages are not just, not just make happier users, they directly uh, impact the bottom line of the site. Uh, so anything we can do to make things faster is good. Now, how many of you have heard of this concept called PJAX? OK, cool. That's about what I expected, maybe like 25% of you. It's still kind of under the radar for some reason. I don't really understand why. Actually, I do understand why, and I'll talk about that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's still under the radar. Uh, what this means is it's basically AJAX, but they replace first A with the letter P, which stands for push state. How many of you guys know push state, HTML5 thing? Cool, it's basically a way of changing the URL of the page without actually going to that page. So you can basically mimic a navigation to a new page without actually having to load that new page. I'll explain that in a second. So PJAX uh, was introduced to me 
uh, maybe a year ago or a little less than that uh, when I got a sneak preview of the new Basecamp, the 37 Signals product. Uh, they've had their old version of Basecamp for many years, and they did this huge redesign and relaunch of it, uh, I think maybe only a month ago. Um, yeah, something like that. Anyway, the, the new, uh, one of the most common complaints they had was that it was such a sluggish site, oh, it's so slow to look at my projects and click the to-dos and all this stuff. Uh, so they redesigned it from the ground up to be very focused on speed, and the primary tool that they use to accomplish that is PJAX. This isn't a very interesting screenshot, uh, but you, what happens is when you click around various links on the site, it only uh, reloads, depending on your click path, but in many cases it only reloads the parts of the page that actually need to change, and that makes it super zippy and really, really awesome and fun to use. So I first got a sneak preview of that, like I said, a little uh, while ago. I, I live in Chicago, and we have you know, 37 Signals who make this product or base there, so we have little web developer meetups. We crazy geeks. And then also on GitHub, uh, you see this technique used uh, specifically on the uh, browsing, I think it's called the tree view. Uh, so if you're looking at the files in a project, and then you click on one of them, so this is my little fork of Django, if you click on one of these directories, it will actually uh, just load the content part, and it's super fast and does this cool little swipe animation thing, and it just feels very responsive uh, compared to what it probably would feel like without that. Uh, now the, uh, the main... If you Google PJAX, the number one hit is this thing, which is uh, one of the original implementations, pjax.heroku.com. Uh, it's basically just a demo site, and I'll walk you through this very quickly to, to show you how it works. Uh, you go to this first page. You notice at the top there it says it's 7.47, 41 p.m. That's the time as of when you loaded the page, when I took this screenshot. Uh, and if you click that link, Dinosaurs, uh, you go to a new page, and the URL changes to dinosaurs.html, but that time doesn't change. So what this demonstrates is that it's just loading the content without touching the rest of the page, that the rest of the page is stale. And then you can click this third link, Aliens, and get those aliens. What, what is that from, like, a Pixar movie? Toy Story. Oh, Toy Story, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Scrap that from the video. Displaying my ignorance. So, so this is the like, canonical PJAX example. Now, uh, you can get the code for that at GitHub. It's defunct. Or just Google jQuery PJAX. It's also linked to from that old site. Uh, let me quickly walk you through how that works to give you some context on sort of the state of the art with this stuff. The way it works is you... Uh, you decorate every link on your page uh, with a little bit of metadata that tells you which div, which uh, content uh, block on the page should be replaced when you click that link. So here in this example, I just grabbed this directly from the, the GitHub page. If you were to click that link explore, it'll load the URL explore via Ajax and then it'll take whatever it gets back, and it'll put it in the div id equals main. And then that's all you have to do other than uh, this one last thing, which is uh, run a quick jQuery function on any link that has a data-pjax attribute. OK, makes sense? Another way you can use it is uh, a little more, uh, a little actually, less obtrusive. You can, instead of putting the, the div right in the element, you can just give it a class and then externally in your JavaScript pass that. And then there's also this third way that lets you do it completely separately. So you don't have to put any cruft in your markup. You just entirely, in, in your JavaScript, set up the PJAX. Now the other end of it is that your server has to know when a PJAX request comes in uh, so that it returns only the content. Does that make sense? So uh, this is just a 
stupid example of how you might do that in Django. The uh, pjax requests send this special X header, X pjax. So you would just check on the server side if that header is in there, use a different template. Maybe that template doesn't have the navigation or whatever, it's just giving you the content, and then return it. So what ends up happening is the first time you load the page, you get the whole thing. Uh, but if that X Ajax header was in there, it would only return something that looks like this, which is just the content of the page. Does this make sense? It's pretty simple stuff. So uh, there are a couple of little frameworky kind of things that are being built up around this. So this is something called Django PJAX, which is a third-party thing made by Jacob, also from the Django world. Uh, it's kind of uh, ugly to have to put this logic in all over the place. If the PJAX X headers in there do this, otherwise do this. So they just wrap that up and put it into a, a Python decorator, which is this thing. And that just says, do PJAX. And then it takes care of all the things behind the scenes. There's still some problems with that that I'll get into. Uh, now, I've sort of shown you the state of the art. Oh, and how many of you have done something like this, not necessarily using one of these PJAX official frameworky things, just sort of done it, you know? OK. Yeah, I found myself over the last couple of years just sort of doing this more and more. And I think that, you know, that to me is the sign of, you know, there, there's clearly a need for this. I talked to a lot of web developers who, who also do this, but they're always kind of like hacking things together and so messy because you're dealing with server side and client side, and it's just bad news, sort of amateur hour. So, uh, so that, that is a sign to me that this needs to be bundled up and packaged and made shiny into a nice uh, library or framework. Uh, so there's a couple of problems with these existing frameworks. One is that they only handle one content box. So a URL, if it's just accessed normally, gives you the whole thing. If it's accessed with PJAX, it just gives you the content. Well, there's a fundamental assumption there that there's just one block of content for the page. But uh, in this Wikipedia page again, for example, there are two distinct boxes of content. There's the, the obvious piece of content, but then there's also this languages thing which is relative to the, the topic. So this gives you links to read this exact article in other languages. And of course, different articles have only been translated for certain languages, so that's unique for the article. So if you, you, you couldn't use the existing PJAX stuff on this, you would have to decide, oh, well, this is going to remain stale, or be able to do some custom thing to bring it in, I don't really know and just do that as the main content, or may probably not, not even use it. So that's a big problem. The second one is that there's non-visible changes. So uh, at the top, I actually lied on the previous slide. Uh, there's, there are other changes that, that come up in, in a Wikipedia page if you click from page to page. This thing at the top is the links to talk and view history and edit, and those are specific to the page that you're looking at. So when you click to a new page, that changes. But nothing visible changes. It's the URLs that change. So the PJAX thing, if you're doing a diff, it needs to somehow take that into account. It's starting to be a very interesting problem. Uh, then there's also the problem of context switching, which I just mentioned. It's a huge pain to s spend a third of your time or a fourth of your time thinking about JavaScript and then another portion of your time talking about thinking about Python or Ruby or whatever, PHP. COBOL, and then you're thinking about SQL, whatever else, HTML, CSS. The more we can whittle that down to just, you know, maybe just knock one of them off, the better, then the more sane we'll all be, right? I think SQL is actually kind of a solved problem with object relational mappers, ORMs, in that you can basically just kind of, in Django, run some Python and it'll do the right thing behind the scenes. So that's you still have to think about it when you're modeling data, but when you're querying it, it's more or less kind of been put aside and you don't have to think about it. But for the JavaScript and Python stuff, huge problem. And then the big problem, come on. 
Computers should be doing this. Come on, I mean, come on. So a, a framework knows how to generate every page of the site as sort of its job. So if you're, so it, it's, it's possible and, and not super hard for it to tell the differences between pages, right? It's all, it's the framework is making both of them. It's not like it's some black box and you have to like poke at it and reverse engineer it. You know how to do it. So this, this should be done completely automatically. And that's my solution, auto PJAX. Now, if you go to tinyurl.com slash Django PJAX, that's where you'll get the latest and greatest, but there's a reason that I use this particular background image. This comes from the Wikipedia page for Vapor. That's because it's Vaporware. Uh, I'm, I'm in the design stages. I haven't actually finished implementing it. Uh, my goal here is to tell you what's coming up. And also for any of you who are using other frameworks, other environments, I want to inspire you to do the same thing because the more of this we have out in the wild, in the wild, the better. Uh, so if you go there, you'll be woefully disappointed. And I'm actually kind of embarrassed to be talking about vaporware. It's the first time I've ever done that. Uh, and it kind of sucks. But, uh, but hopefully that'll, I'll make up for it in the excitement and the coolness of, of the thing that, that we're working on. So auto PJAX, there's a couple of goals. One is basically what I've been talking about. So when you view a page on a site for the first time, the framework generates all the HTML. When you go to a next page, it just generates the stuff that's different. And instead of requiring you to do this weird JavaScript calls, it's just completely automated and you don't have to do anything. You just add like one line of configuration to your Django installation and boom, it just does that. Okay? That would be awesome. That's goal number one. Goal number two is, of course, support multiple content boxes. And it gets very hairy very quickly, uh, which I'll spend the majority of the talk today talking about, because it's kind of very interesting problems to think about. So we have to solve this. We have to solve that other thing that I talked about, which is non-visible changes. So if, if the links change, but the text doesn't actually change, you've got to do that too when you, when you click on a new link. Respect URLs and permalinks and avoid hash bangs, which are like the devil's spawn. So uh, what I mean by that is URLs that have a hash and then an exclamation point. You see them on Twitter. You used to see them on Facebook. They cleaned up their act. Uh, but uh, my philosophy here is that the web is all about links that are predictable and uh, machine readable and don't require JavaScript to access. Whew, I could like rant about that. Uh, goal number five is sort of similar. I'll again pick on Twitter. Did you know that if you open up a new browser tab and you go to a Twitter permalink with a hash bang? So uh, actually, the other day, do you know this Twitter account called Daily Ticks? It's uh, tickets for the Colbert sh Colbert Report and The Daily Show, and they're like added like one at a time. You have to follow it to get tickets. Anyway, I scored tickets tomorrow, so I'm going to go on The Colbert Show tomorrow. Anyway, uh, did you know that when you go to a uh, Twitter permalink page, because of this stupid hash thing, it loads your timeline first, and then once it's loaded, on top of that, it loads whatever you were actually intending to load? Have you ever experienced that? It's, it's ridiculous. So that is not something that I want to promote in the world. I want to kill that in the world. Uh, so a design philosophy here is that if you go to a permalink, there's no JavaScript necessary. You just get the, the whole rendered HTML from, from the get-go. Another goal is to bail if needed. By the way, did I get the numbers wrong? I think it went from seven to six. Oh, no, it's good. So uh, the site I work for is called everyblock.com, and this is the, the city homepage. And if I were to click on one of these links, it goes to something like that, a detail page. These pages are dramatically different. 
and, and the benefits of PJAX on them are basically zero. So a design goal of this should be to detect that case, and if that's true, don't even bother doing AJAX and all that, the crazy diff stuff. Just do a redirect to the page. Then finally, uh, security is super important. Actually, not finally. This is second to last. <laughs> security is super important. I will find as we look into this that uh, we're going to expose some internals of your app sort of out of necessity in order for this all to work. Uh, and we shouldn't expose any more that we actually need to. Uh, another goal is favor correctness. So if I am going to a site that's powered by this new auto PJAX and I click a link and it like gets out of sync with the real page or the diff went wrong or something, that should never happen because uh, that ugh, is just horrible and uh, obviously your users get pissed off at you and it's not good. Uh, I realize that there's a lot of magic going on here and it's important to win developers' trust. Uh, it's, if, if a developer turns on this feature, it's, you know, it's got to be rock solid. Uh, and finally, the, a, a big goal is just to amaze people with it. I love working on stuff that's sort of like, wow, how the heck did that work? That's like completely magical. So really want to accomplish that with this new feature. So I was talking about this uh, with somebody and they were saying, well, why, instead of passing bits of HTML over the place, like the diff of the page, why wouldn't you just pass a bunch of structured data, just JSON? So for Wikipedia, it would be the title of the page, the content, the last edited, you know, structured stuff. The problem with that is then you then somehow need to figure out how to make that into HTML. So you need a JavaScript side template language. Uh, and I would rather avoid that and just have one template language so as not to have my brain explode. Uh, and also, back to this point of doing juggling Python and JavaScript and SQL and all this stuff, I want to optimize for one of those. And it's going to be Python because I like it more. Uh, but you have to do it anyway. You know, it, if you optimize for JavaScript, you would still have to do Python. So you might as well optimize for the thing that you have to do anyway, if that makes any sense. And it's more fun, emoticon. So let's, uh, let's take an example of how this, uh, so now I'm going I'm to take you through my thinking on how this feature will work, and specifically the back end, which is where all the crazy magic happens. So if you go, uh, just pretend Wikipedia is powered by Django and they've enabled this new magic auto PJAX stuff. So you go to the web page for web page. First thing is uh, that there will be some JavaScript that detects all the on-site links because you don't need to do that for an external link. Uh, it's only for stuff on this, on, this, uh, on this site. And for each one of them, you set the on-click. So when you click the link, and it's an internal link, uh, you load that URL with AJAX. You send this PJAX header to give a little hint that, oh, this is a PJAX request, so it should be different. And you pass the current URL that you're on so that it knows what to make a diff against. That makes sense? Then when the response comes in, it's going to take the diffs and just replace the page, and that's this purple magic that I'll talk about later. Uh, conveniently brushing that aside. And then on, if any error happens, just load the next page manually as if they click the link without PJAX. And by the way, if you guys have any questions or if this is stupid or doesn't make sense, feel free to just yell out. Where did this happen? Sir? On the server side? You on the server side, yeah. I'll, I'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. That's the convenient purple magic. Yeah. So I guess a quick question how useful this is. Most pages uh, do actually have a lot of Same one of these, the big things like images 
Jenkins, CSS library, JavaScript, mm -hmm. like all that stuff is patched and isn't, isn't uh, replaced already? Totally. Two answers. One, it's not for every site. And if I imply that, I apologize. It's for uh, well, sites like Wikipedia, sites that are very templated. GitHub, good example, uh, where the, the differences are very clear. Uh, but the second thing is, I don't necessarily agree that uh, even in the case of a lot of stuff, that it wouldn't be faster, because it's all about the perception of speed. So if, if, the, if you click a link and the navigation just does not change, it just feels faster, you know? Uh, but again, yeah, it's not for every site. Yeah? Um, what if someone stays on a page for 20 minutes and then clicks one of these links? You're sending the link to the original page, mm -hmm. but if you were to re-render that page, couldn't it be significantly different 20 minutes later than it was? Oh, if, if the content changes uh, a lot? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. That's, I probably wouldn't use it for that case. Yeah. Well, you have no control over how long people sit. Okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the feature for that. Uh, or you, it would be kind of trivial to, like, disable the, the whole logic if it's, um, if the person has waited for, like, more than a minute or something. But. So, uh, and then, your response, uh, or your request, uh, you make the request, you get a bunch of stuff and replace the diffs. On the server side, you have to calculate the diff, which again is magic. We'll talk about that in a second. And then return that as JSON. So just in, in other words, it more, to put it more visually, you click a link that trig triggers an AJAX request. The server says, these particular bits have changed. And then JavaScript changes the exact bits that are different. And then the key is that the URL gets updated so that it looks like you navigated to a new page. And a core philosophy here is that uh, if you actually go to that page, like in a new browser tab, it will be exactly the same. So it's purely a, a speed up. There's no functionality differences. So the, there's the two bits of magic. The server has to figure out, given two pages, which pages are, which pieces of the page are different. And then the client has to figure out, okay, once we've gotten that as structured data as JSON, how do we know where to put that in the page? That's like in itself a hard problem. So I'll give you a quick overview of one approach to this. Uh, does anyone know what template inheritance is, Django's concept of template inheritance? Okay. Awesome, we have some template inheritance versions. So the, the concept here is that you have a base template for your whole site, and that defines a bunch of blocks, which are holes that child templates can then fill. And if you have a, a child template, that extends a parent, so this guy extends base.html, and then it only has to define the blocks. So for this particular one, it puts first child in there, welcome to the first child in block content. And then a different template can also extend base and put different stuff in there. So what ends up happening is you have a base.html for your whole site, and then for certain types of pages, you might have a secondary level that extends base, and then it defines another block, another bunch of blocks, and then you have other templates that override those blocks and create new blocks. It becomes this tree of basically the design structure of your site. It's a useful, useful feature. So put in a different way visually, in your base.html, you have this uh, bunch of HTML, and then you have a block called h1 that is filled by a child template, a bunch of other stuff, and then block content, and then these two child templates just override that. Now, if you think about the the way PJAX would work with this is actually pretty simple in, in the trivial case uh, where the template knows what the blocks are. If you go to, if you navigate, say that's child one, the, the URL is child one. If you navigate to child two and it uses that same base template, the only thing that's different is the two blocks, 
the values of the blocks. So all it has to do is pass back the block name and then the value. So that's actually pretty easy. Now the, the flip side of it is once we've gotten that data from the server, how do we put it back into the document? It needs something to hook into. So you, you know that the H1 has changed from this to this, but how do you hook into the H1 to actually make the change? Uh, one, the first thing that I experimented with was for every uh, hole in the template, every block, you would wrap around it a div with some unique name. And then it would be able to know exactly where to put it. Does that make sense? Okay. So in JavaScript, it would just look like this, you know, pop that in there, pop that in there. Easy stuff. So uh, putting that all together, you have your template as written. Then when it's uh, rendered, the values are rendered and those divs get put in, which are blue in that example. Then the AJAX request passes the PJAX header, gets a response, and does a bunch of JavaScript, and then the important history.push state, which changes the URL. Makes sense. Now, aside from blocks, there's also template variables, just like any template language. So here's what it happens to look like in Django with these double curly braces. Uh, the way that would work in, in this first uh, bit of thinking would be any variable in the template would be surrounded by a span and given a unique ID so then PJAX would know how to get back into it. But then it starts to get tricky. So I think maybe some of you are telling like, okay, this is super trivial examples. Of course, the real world isn't like that. That's what I found out very, very quickly. So if you uh, have your HTML template and you put in a title, you obviously can't surround it with a div or a span because that is uh, not presentational. Uh, so JavaScript needs to special case it and say document title is this when, when the, if the title were to change with PJAX. Then you have this other problem. How does the framework know that that's a title? Because there's no HTML uh, knowledge about this title. It's just a bunch of text. Uh, so how does it know that for that particular value, it doesn't get the span or doesn't get the div when it's rendered? OK, that's kind of a, a big problem. Option number one that I first played with was giving each variable a hint as to what it is. So you would put title after that, and that would tell the framework that it's a title, so it uses document.title equals in the resulting JavaScript. So this is a lot of, starting to get a lot of abstractions and weird, crazy, crazy stuff. Obvious problem here is that it requires us to extend the template syntax, and it requires template authors to put title and, and annotate all their stuff, and that really sucks. Option number two is to actually parse the HTML and you would then know just from the semantics of HTML that that is a title because your parser knows what parts of the page are what. The problem is that the parser would, be, would have to be super sophisticated. It would not only have to know the Django template language, it would sort of have to walk back. First it parses the Django template language and then for all the strings in it, it would have to parse that as HTML. And then for any embedded JavaScript, it would have to have a JavaScript parser any CSS, it would have to have a CSS parser. It would get super ludicrous, super fast. There is actually something like this that exists, but I have a feeling it's insane. Uh, option number three is just always change the title. That's what uh, this jQuery PJAX library does. So on any PJAX request, it requires you to send the title of the new page regardless of whether it's changed or not. That actually turns out to be the best idea. Just screw it. Don't worry about these micro-optimizations. Just always change the title, OK? Then there's this problem of partial titles. Again, screw it. Just always change the title. Now we get into some more hairy, nasty, like Richard Stallman hairy stuff. So if you have stuff that uh, attributes that aren't uh, visible, 
So an, uh, an attribute of an HTML tag or uh, anything that's not presentational. For instance, here we have the body class that's dynamic. It comes in via a template variable. And then here we have a p tag. And then within it, you just have a bunch of like gunk that you paste in there. And then we have content, which is fine. You can wrap a div around that. But how does the framework know what body class and p adders are? Uh, and then how does it know how to take the pjax, the diff, and pop it in there? I wrestled with this one for a long time. Uh, one option is to search the parents of the document until you find a container that's actually sane, uh, and then just replace that container, as opposed to doing this micro-optimization. That's sort of the equivalent of, oh, just always replace the title. That's an OK solution. Another one is you parse the HTML and you get semantic knowledge of the document, and you actually do like sup like almost expathy, like super tightly constrained statements as to how you replace the text. Uh, so what I ended up deciding on was scrapping this idea of putting the divs in there because it just it only works for a limited case of stuff. And uh, actually send the uh, expathy jQuery selector stuff down the wire. So what it looks like is instead of sending the name of the block and then what's changed, you, you actually send statements in the JSON as to what you need to do to the document to change it. This is a lot, um, it's a lot safer, it, it's a lot more powerful at the same time. Does that make sense? Now there's evil HTML snippets. So if you have a div and then you dynamically put in something, but your something includes a close caret, uh, which of course is valid, but it's really stupid and evil. Uh, what the heck do we do there? My solution is don't do that. <laughs> uh, so we don't support that. Uh, there's a couple of, I was brainstorming all the kinds of changes that can be made to an HTML document. There's, of course, blocks. There's uh, inline elements, text, uh, the title of the page, which we already have a good solution for, thank God. The title bit, same thing. Uh, CSS, though, if, if, if a, you're going from one page to another and the other one makes some change to the CSS, you'd have to dynamically add that, dynamically make that change via JavaScript. So that's a whole other ball of wax. And then there's stuff like meta tags, which I, I just like bucket this as the dull category. So if, if the second page has some, like the RSS link changed, actually, that's a bad example. I would argue that that's worth bringing in the new version. Uh, but if like it's some Facebook open graph meta tags or whatever, you don't even need to bother with that. So this is the dull bucket that it's just not going to deal with. And then there's critical stuff where it's the opposite of dull, where if, you, if that changes, just reload the page and don't even bother trying to do the diff. Uh, because it's, this is for stuff like JavaScript. So if your template has some custom JavaScript that's just for this page, it's not worth it to make some huge framework that like register the JavaScript for this new page whenever the page changes. Just, just reload the page. So I talked about the very basic cases, like variables and blocks. But what about template logic? So if this, I'll put that. Otherwise, I'll put that. The solution is to treat that whole thing as a changeable thing. So uh, everything within body would be treated as one blob that can be diffed. And it gets uh, a little more complicated with nested logic. But again, we treat each blob as a changeable thing. Template logic can show up in crafty places. So uh, here we have a body class that has an if or else. So uh, that gets very, very hairy, uh, figuring out the, the diff of, of that. Uh, and then removal of markup gets kind of insane. So. Uh, if you have this as your template and then uh, condition is true, subcondition is false, you get these three different possibilities. 
if you navigate from this one to that one, you actually have to remove stuff. So the, this whole magic PJX thing has to account for the removal of elements as well, uh, which isn't that hard, but it, we have to think about it. So putting this all together, you have your template. Uh, it renders, the AJAX request is made, so that sends that PJAX header. Uh, it gets a response of the instruction, the JavaScript, JavaScript instructions to execute on the page in order to change it to the new thing. And then it uh, actually executes those and does the push state, and that's it. Now, I wanted to talk about security. Uh, in the original version of this, where we had the automatically created divs, we used the, the uh, variable name in the name of the div, div, and that would be exposing your internal stuff to the public. And so if you have hello stupid username where you've never expected that anyone would ever see that, that would have been exposed. So that was another reason that I sort of put that solution aside, decided not to do that. Uh, the newest solution with instructions doesn't have to deal with that problem. Uh, and also, auto-escaping is a big, big concern. So by default, everything in the Django template language is escaped. So to prevent uh, cross-site scripting attacks, uh, I just have to take care that anything that comes in from the, this diff stuff is correctly escaped. Otherwise, there'd be massive problems with cross-site scripting. Now, we have a couple of bonus features when this is all implemented, we'll get a bunch of stuff for free, and it's really, really exciting. The first is deferred loading. So I don't know if you remember the old Google Analytics before they redesigned, but uh, when you would go to the main dashboard page, this stuff wouldn't actually load until a couple seconds later, and that was for just fast, fast page loading. Uh, that's, that's a pain to implement. It's sort of like, you know, for those of you who raise your hands, yeah, we hacked together some solution that already does this. It's painful. There's no general purpose tool that does that. Uh, we would basically get this for free with this new uh, auto PJAX thing. What you would do is just put a, whatever you want to call it, defer load tag around whichever parts of the page you wanted to defer. And that would put in the logic that just, you know, waited a couple of seconds, or when, when you loaded the page originally, it would spawn off a separate AJAX request to load that in there. And you get that absolutely for free, which is great. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, part of this will be a template scanner that looks at all of your templates and figures out which combinations are good and bad. So to address your question back there, uh, it would tell you, so if, if someone goes from this type of page to this type of page, only one thing changes, so that's awesome. But if someone goes from this type of page to this type of page, that's pretty much a wash, like don't even bother with the PJAX. So uh, the plan is to have this utility that scans all your templates, figures out all the combinations, uh, and uses that data to inform when you actually do the logic. Yeah? Should this also take care of, say, for instance, if I'm replacing the inline element with the block element, or if there's an incompatibility, Say if I'm putting, I cannot put a div inside this panel. So in that, in that case, should it just do anything or do it It would probably do a, a, the reload in that case, yeah. Uh, so you may think that this sounds like a horrible amount of work, uh, but my answer to that is, yeah, that's on me and that's on the Django team. and you as the users of the framework will never have to deal with these diff algorithms, assuming we get it right. Uh, big assumption, but you know, assuming we get it right. So you'll never have to deal with any of this stuff. You'll just add a line of configuration to your code and automatically get the benefits. Maybe you run that utility to see if it's worth it for your particular site. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the goal. My, my goal with the talk was to give you an idea of the complexity behind the scenes, because there's very interesting uh, technical problems in there. Uh, and again, that's the URL if you want to take a look at what's there already. And if you're interested in helping out, drop me an email. If you're interested in implementing it in any other framework or any other area 
let me know also. I'd love to promote it and, uh, and see it succeed. All right, well, thanks, guys. That's it. <laughs> any, any other questions? Did you do any tests yeah. with like analytics or ads, like script tags that need to trigger an extra page loading? Like how would Google know that they went to another page? Oh yeah, it would be up to you to push that. to push that to Google Analytics that it's a new page view. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that you know there's alternative ways to you know transfer Ajax, um, to JSON, and then use a template library. So yeah. with proliferation of like things like Agile.js and more sort of client side, like where do you see these techniques fitting into sort of the continuum of, you know, I'm going to do a lot of stuff on the client, I'm going to do everything server side. This seems to be kind of in the middle. Can you just talk about Yeah, that's on that, that is the question, capital T, capital Q. I don't know how it interacts with like Backbone. Uh, my instinct would be to say, if you have a very JavaScript heavy app, don't use this at all, because it'll probably only cause problems. Uh, but if you're looking for a very quick performance win, and you don't have a lot of dynamic stuff happening in the site, turn it on, and it'll be good. But the, yeah, the, the, the interplay between this and JavaScript, like intense JavaScript stuff, is something that We'll only know once it's no longer vaporware uh, what'll happen. Is there another? Yeah. So, uh, so I, th I think if I heard you correctly, you're basically going to render the previous page and then render the new page and through some algorithm do the diff and send back the changes. Yes. So you now double the load on your database and you double the load on your rendering engine. How? Uh, there's another part to this that I didn't get into which is changing the way that view functions work, that the controller, if you know Rails, uh, changing the way that that works so that it's not just this big monolithic thing that does all the queries it needs to do and, uh, and returns a bunch of stuff. Split that up into different pieces, and then, which requires a little you know, refactoring of your code, but split it up into atomic pieces so so that the PJAX stuff can only grab the ones that it needs. If that makes sense. How is it going to know what it needs to the actual HTML to do the diff? It can look at the templates before it looks at the data. Okay. Yeah. It's not perfect, though. I'm, yeah. that's, that's an ongoing concern of mine. Yeah. Anything else? Was there something back there? Yeah. Um, it kind of sounds, I mean, throughout the whole talk, I've been reminded of caching kinds of problems, you know? Mm -hmm. It's really hard, kind of like caching. And it almost seems, well, with Basecamp New, um, they, they did a lot with uh, caching fragments. Um, and this almost seems like it might be a way to exploit that existing, uh, I don't know, Django has that as well, but yeah. that ex existing framework of these nested um, chunks of, of yeah, cached content flip it on its head and say, OK, this inner part changed. Instead of invalidating up the tree, we just use PJAX. Yeah, um, I love it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Is that it? All right, thanks, guys, for coming.